Thank you, Jeremy. Um, so uh, I guess we've had a nice introduction uh, from Susan in the last talk about a lot of the different risk factors that come into the immunogenicity assessment. Um, and uh, I guess as Bonnie was pointing out that there may not have been a lot of therapeutic examples in there. I've got a few therapeutic examples, but I'd be obviously happy to talk to you about um, sort of uh, the strategies and how you apply the ex vivo assays uh, in that context as well as we get to the Q&A. Just uh, kind of thinking about the challenges of immunogenicity in this sense of it being an unwanted immunogenicity and we're trying to avoid it. Um, there are some of those things, as, uh, as Susan alluded to, the complexity of the immune system is uh, a, really a big issue in trying to actually work out what risk does my drug have. Uh, and also we often find uh, that um, a number of our project teams work on drugs where they're looking to dampen down immune responses and there's a, uh, I guess an initial position they take is, hey well we're reducing immunogenicity, we're not going to have a problem for our drug. And uh, you know, kind of probably all too frequently they find out that that's not the case and just because uh, you're sending your uh, you know, often therapeutic antibody right into the heart of the immune system, it's actually more likely sometimes to cause an immune response than actually uh, alleviate that response. Uh, but the other issue of course that we face as well is that we don't necessarily see uh, the outcome of immunogenicity until later in development. So you know, a really, really big challenge for us is to not kind of wait until we get to the point where we've got that response, but to try and deal with it up front. Hence uh, my little uh, cartoon on here, sort of um, you know, being a habit of a highly successful person and hopefully a habit of a highly successful drug development team is to really think about what your end profile is going to look like and uh, certainly at the stage where you're going to have to build that into your uh, protein design, you've got to think really early about these kind of issues. So um, low immunogenicity is really important, how you apply the current assays that you've got and uh, indeed how to be uh, predictive. Um, uh, I'll probably return to this a couple of times, but when we think about being predictive, uh, we often have to caution ourselves and say, well, you know, we're not going to predict uh, maybe the percent of people who get an anti-drug antibody response, or we're not going to predict what kind of adverse event they might see, but we want to kind of gauge what our risk level is, so we go into higher risk uh, uh, categories where that may be okay for some indications, um, you know, we saw uh, how in oncology that sometimes <coughs> they're only sort of prolonging life of uh, patients and on current treatment by a matter of months, maybe you know one or two years. Uh, if you've got quite a strong immune response to a therapeutic, that may not be a problem necessarily for that kind of indication. When you look at things like rheumatoid arthritis, where you might be looking at 10, 20, potentially 30 years, well, yeah, it's a, it could be a big deal as to how much immunogenicity you get. So, uh, as I say, the uh, approach is typically for immunogenicity. In the past, we've been observing it, describing it, and trying to manage the immunogenicity. But we want to kind of hop back to uh, our, our thinking, what, what do we want to look like? So, in the future, we want to be able to predict what that immunogenicity would look like, uh, and actually try to avoid it. And as, uh, I think this is a, a key piece when it comes to actually designing the proteins, designing the clinical trials, uh, and indeed thinking about other aspects of uh, risk that may, uh, we may be able to influence as we go through a development program. So the complexity of immunogenicity, I wanted to capture at least a, a little bit here, uh, just to describe that, you know, kind of, we go from putting our therapeutic protein in uh, on the left hand side and getting an anti-drug antibody response which uh, may be detrimental in some way on the right hand side, uh, but we do at least have some understanding of the processes that are involved in generating that immune response. So, um, you know, initial engagement with uh, dendritic cells may well be through uh, uh, sort of in innate immune type activation pathways, uh, but certainly the, the key piece for us in terms of driving, uh, particularly those classways, so IgG uh, responses and, and high titer responses, then the adaptive immune system's got to be involved there. So, you know, the engagement with the T cells, um, I've kind of drawn this as a linear pathway then through to the B cells. I appreciate that there might be a lot of crosstalk going on and indeed lots of different subsets of uh, cells that may be involved in this process. Uh, but at least for uh, to simplify at this stage, kind of just highlighting that um, the, we see sort of dendritic cell T cell interaction being an important key step. Uh, and then of course obviously the T cell being able to interact with uh, a B cell that's actually going to produce your anti-drug antibodies. 
Um, a number of other things I wanted to capture on this slide were alluded to previously. Uh, of course, we try and think about the patients uh, and the immune status of the patients, but you know, really capturing the genetic diversity of those uh, uh, patients is something that we would like to do early on. Uh, in the context of, uh, you know, I guess almost a, a preclinical immunogenicity <laughs> trial. So, uh, you know, we're kind of thinking on many different levels as well with the immune system. That there's uh, the level of the the antigen and what you're presenting. Uh, there's the level of the immune cells that are actually interacting, and indeed the organs in which they interact. Um, we also then think about well, when the antidrug antibodies are produced, that's happening at a systemic level and the impact uh, potentially on uh, the drug, things such as enhanced clearance rate, will happen at that whole body level. Um, and again, I'll capture here, just for the sake of looking at these different levels of the system, that uh, things like the genetics, the MHC type of the patient will come into play. So uh, we know there's a number of different tools that we can uh, utilize to try and help our risk assessment. And um, uh, you know, one of the key things is to try and actually uh, pull all these together to actually get that uh, prediction or, or, I guess, assessment of uh, overall risk. So um, uh, I won't go into too much detail on the in silico and the in vitro tools today, uh, but focus on those ex vivo tools. There are also a number of different animal models that are being looked at, whether that be uh, just in, in mice as they are or whether there's various humanized type of mice that are being looked at. Uh, again, I won't really uh, delve into that area. Uh, today. Um, and then kind of the, the bottom diagram here, which I'll just kind of highlight here, is a, um, an approach that we're taking to try and integrate all the data. So we, we take a uh, sort of a, a mathematical modeling approach where we try and look at the data we generate on the, the cells, but also then how the cells interact with each other. Uh, and that we believe will be a, a good route forward to ultimately integrating the data we have. Um, you know, and I think one of the key things around how we start off very early in development is that we can apply in silico tools. And uh, uh, to my knowledge, there's only really this one paper that highlights how in silico tools have been predictive of uh, an outcome in terms of a T cell epitope response. Um, so this was uh, an FC fusion protein. Uh, I think it was uh, actually a, a shortish peptide that was attached to that FC fusion protein and um, uh, I believe this was an Amgen project. Uh, they worked with Epivax to look at well where would the, the risk in that peptide be. They highlighted that um, uh, towards the C terminus of that protein so that what they did is they looked at the different uh, peptides from that protein and found that um, these peptides towards the end would be predicted to be the best binders to HIA molecules. Um, they were also then able to go on and show that where they've got some binding predicted, particularly with the 0701, uh, they saw T cells from those patients. Now, uh, you know, this is kind of a, uh, in a sense, a nice validation of the uh, um, in silico, but of course there's so many gaps that we have to fill. And, and I mean, one thing that you could look at here is that there, there are also, um, uh, I guess, indications that there might be some hits that would come up from a, an HLA type that uh, actually doesn't generate an antibody response. So, you know, I think it would be easy, uh, and it's probably generally recognised that we're over-predicted within silico, and whilst you can kind of cherry-pick occasions where something turned out to be right by in silico, uh, it doesn't necessarily help you early in development if you're kind of thinking that the whole protein could be immunogenic and we've got to redesign everything. So, um, you know, I think going, uh, moving on from in silico into an ex vivo type assay is a very useful way to, to kind of conduct this preclinical trial, if you like. Um, so there's a few assays that I want to touch on today. Um, hopefully Jeremy has covered lots of these details for you yesterday, and again, my apologies, I couldn't be here yesterday, I've missed uh, Jeremy's talk there. And you might even recognise from the diagrams that I've uh, I blatantly borrowed these from ProImmune. So, um, you know, I think at, at the level of the dendritic cell, there are quite a lot of things that we can do in an ex vivo sense. So the dendritic cell T cell assay, um, this is uh, uh, certainly has utility around looking at, well, you know, is your protein actually taken up, processed, presented, and is there a T cell that's actually going to recognize uh, some epitope from that protein? Um, 
what we've uh, also been uh, looking at is around the PBMC assay where uh, instead of looking, I guess, globally and saying my protein might have a problem, uh, taking those peptides and saying, well, you know, these are the peptides which we think may be a problem, or indeed maybe these are the peptides that we could do something about, uh, and putting those into uh, an assay where, again, we're looking for uh, the T cell. So, you know, we're not looking at the processing step here, but we are at least getting an understanding of whether the, um, uh, there's going to be a T cell that would recognize that particular epitope if, uh, you know, if everything came together in a bad sense for the uh, uh, patient. So you know, any, any step we can do here to try and re-engineer that, remove those, is certainly useful. Uh, sometimes it may come at a time when we, we're not necessarily able to make that change, but at least we've got an awareness about the risk of that potential sequence. Um, so another area we're looking at are uh, DC activation uh, assays. That um, certainly we know when we add the proteins into the dendritic cells, you're probably not going to get anything out if the dendritic cells just kind of taking a look and going, yeah, it just doesn't interest me that protein. So um, one of the uh, key indicators, which probably gets to a bit of a more mechanistic level, is to see whether you get uh, upregulation of typical activation markers. So we've got a, a panel that we look at. I mean, HLA-DR is obviously a good indicator in the sense of not only is that the activation of the dendritic cell, but uh, if you've got uptake of your therapeutic protein and processing, well, you obviously need the, uh, um, uh, the HLA molecules there to present to uh, the T cells. Um, the other assay which we're uh, finding uh, intriguing, I think, at this stage, and certainly can be helpful in terms of trying to, to make a call between different candidates would be the antigen uptake assay. Uh, and this is a, a confocal microscopy approach. Um, really kind of looking to say, well, you know, we're kind of anticipating the dendritic cell is going to take up the antigen. Really then, what does it do with it? Um, and where we've seen this uh, co-localization with late endosomes, uh, we see that that can be a, uh, certainly one way where you get um, uh, the sort of presentation that perhaps, or, or the processing step, which will enable the presentation. Uh, and the last one on here, the, the dendritic cell mass spec assay, which I think is pro-present or pro-immune health. Um, this then would be really to look at, in the context of a protein that is taken up and uh, processed and presented, actually what is presented. So uh, you can see you get something a little different from each of these assays. Now I'll go into an example of each of these uh, that we've done and, and you know, maybe that will help kind of think through uh, the utility for uh, potentially your own programs. Or indeed if it raises any questions about um, uh, how this ex vivo scenario would link through to an in vivo scenario, I think that would also be uh, useful feedback that I'm looking to get from this audience too. Okay, so we have an example of uh, PBMC assay here. And so, you know, I've described this as looking for that specific epitope risk. So uh, this is uh, kind of the, the sort of typical readout looking at uh, a range of different donors and the percent of stimulation, i.e. the amount of, uh, that the T cells have proliferated in response to that peptide. So uh, with the uh, controls at the bottom here, flag this up, so I realize there's a lot of bars on this. So uh, and we're working up from the bottom that there are um, uh, controls such as PPD and KLH, which are, are very strong stimulators in this assay. Uh, the hemagglutinin uh, peptide and uh, tetanus toxoid peptide uh, come in kind of probably quite nicely in the range of the assay where we see responses to uh, uh, peptides from therapeutic proteins. So these are quite good benchmarks. Uh, and then there's also the peptide pools derived from uh, KLH and then the CEFT pool. Uh, so this kind of indicates um, uh, sort of the, the ranges on the assay. And you can see from, a, uh, in this case, with an endogenous protein, a fully human version of this, i.e. You know, peptides from humans, germline, should all be um, uh, tolerized to. Uh, the, you kind of see this sort of bobbling around the zero mark, um, uh, very low uh, responses. Uh, when we take in some mutated versions of uh, peptides, that um, you know, these uh, on occasion do sort of stimulate the T cells in a way that uh, would start to raise concerns. So again, it uh, depends quite on the program as to whether you've got your other risk factors are pointing towards you know, a high risk and you want to kind of avoid these things. 
Um, so in the case of an endogenous protein, that may well be around, does the patient you're trying to give this protein to have this protein, or is this a replacement? Uh, where you may kind of be able to, in a replacement case, you might be able to get away with a bit more, uh, a bit more of a risk. But of course, you don't want to drive such a strong immune response to your protein that you, you lose your efficacy. Excuse me. <coughs> the coffee wasn't quite enough, Jeremy. <laughs> okay, so uh, an example of a dendritic cell T cell assay now. So it's a similar kind of readout. So uh, the stimulation uh, or the response index is uh, uh, sort of a, a derived from both the magnitude of the response and the number of donors that are responding. Um, in this assay, again, we've got uh, the PPD and the KLH working up from the bottom. Uh, and we've actually got four monoclonal antibodies in here. And um, uh, what we were, were doing here was looking at um, uh, a highly immunogenic antibody. So this had been into a, a phase one clinical trial. There was, uh, I guess, just less than 80% of people receiving that drug ended up with an antibody response to it. And this was supposed to be one of those uh, uh, immune modulators that would downregulate the immune system. So you know, I think it, it caught people by surprise a few years ago. Um, but we were also then had a, um, an antibody in here that was uh, seemed to be low immunogenicity in a, I guess, a comparable type trial, you know, single dose uh, in the phase one. Um, and so, you know, we, we were able to kind of put some benchmarks into this assay for what looked like, uh, you know, the good guy and the bad guy, if you like. Um, at the time, we were also looking to see whether, you know, if we had a variant of the, um, uh, this uh, PF1 uh, that we could go back to and actually try and test this mechanism with a different antibody, uh, would we be in a good place with these two variants here, two and three? As it turned out that, you know, given that these are still of, um, uh, giving quite strong responses here, uh, this kind of information helped us to say, well, you know, maybe this isn't the right way to go here. Now, I won't say that we uh, had engineered these specifically to reduce T cell responses, uh, or indeed try to get around mechanisms any other way. Uh, these were kind of more sort of off the shelf different variants, but you know, it was certainly quite useful in helping us say that uh, you know, it doesn't make sense to invest in that clinical trial with um, uh, the kind of data that we can generate here. Um, just to cover the uh, dendritic cell uh, mass spec assay, so to identify um, some of the re-engineering potential. So uh, again, the, the sequence I'm showing is um, uh, that protein that had this high level of immunogenicity. Uh, when we applied this uh, mass spec assay, uh, we didn't find any epitopes or, or regions of the heavy chain that were presented, but we found multiple regions of the light chain. Uh, and we were able to identify um, in this uh, thick box here, so to orientate you, the, we've got some underlying regions which may be missing slightly, which are the CDRs, so CDR1, CDR2, and CDR3. Um, we've done some in silico work to predict that, uh, uh, I guess, amongst others, that probably the major peptide would have been a CDR2, um, uh, would bind to HI from a uh, uh, broad range of donors. And indeed, this turned out to be the case when we did this kind of analysis. Um, a note on the in silico, though, that it always, uh, it also uh, showed up uh, in the heavy chain that there was a couple of epitopes that you know, would be potentially things we would want to change. Um, we didn't go on and do anything more with this particular protein with regard to can we re-engineer it and de-immunize. Uh, and I think that speaks to a little bit around the challenge of how we apply these assays in a way that's going to help us make decisions early on in programs. Because um, uh, I guess by the stage you're doing this assay, you, you do have to have quite a lot of protein in hand. Uh, and also, it's, you know, it's quite intensive and, and not particularly cheap to apply across a broad range of uh, uh, your leads, but more like you know if you've got one candidate or if you do want to go back and de-immunize, uh, I think it would be valuable in that respect. Just to uh, uh, put on the, the DC uptake and uh, trafficking, uh, again the same proteins that we've got a, um, uh, a the PF1, so this high immunogenic protein that we know the target for that was on the surface of the dendritic cells. Uh, whereas the, the target of this low immunogenic, 
immunogenic protein. I should be able to say that by now, shouldn't I? <laughs> <laughs> um, the target, uh, it was not present at all on dendritic cells. So our expectation was that um, uh, we would see some difference in terms of the uptake. And, and uh, you know, we're expecting the dendritic cells to take protein up. That's kind of their job, really. Uh, within the context of this assay, we could see that uh, you know, we were able to highlight the late endosome, where the test article's gone, uh, you know, all the caveats around we've now labelled the antibody, so is it behaving differently? You know, we're having to consider in terms of, uh, you know, what makes a suitable control for that. So, you know, I think we've still got further work to, to really understand this assay. But it is quite striking that if you're uh, binding to a receptor on the, or this particular receptor on the target, uh, on the dendritic cell, that that seems to help it uh, enter the cell and be trafficked to the late endosome where you know the next step is it's going to get processed and loaded onto MHC and sure we're not really going to see that because once you start that processing we're going to lose the fluorescence as well um, but this uh, non-immunogenic uh, uh, protein it certainly looks like it's been restricted by compartment but not to the late endosome so you know I think in, in that respect it's this may be, um, and something we probably want to do is look at uh, uh, FC receptor uptake to see whether that's different because uh, has this gone to a, a different compartment for that reason. Um, so I will just comment on this one again then that uh, uh, we think that there is potential if you're looking at uh, you know, maybe antibodies that bind to different epitopes on your target protein that you potentially could pick out something that was favorable uh, if it didn't go to the late endosome now, we don't know yet. It may be that if you're hitting a particular target, whatever antibody you put on it could cause the same problem. So, you know, I think early days for uh, how we use this to do something differently, but at least it does help in terms of our risk assessment. Um, in terms of uh, ex vivo assays as well, just wanted to highlight um, a new technology that's uh, available. So uh, something called CITOF, it's a mass cytometry approach. So um, uh, I guess this is kind of flow cytometry on steroids. So you can not necessarily just do your, you know, maybe your eight color or 10 or 12 if you're really good. Uh, but this has potential to look at maybe 30 to 40 different markers. Um, the company who sells it says it has potential to do like 60, 70. I think we'll settle for 30, 40 right now. And, uh, uh, I mean, the advantage with working in this space is that you don't necessarily have to limit yourself as to which cells you're looking at. You can, I'll uh, uh, refer you to the 2012 Bone and Miller paper, you can map out all of your immune cells. So do your immunophenotyping panel. Um, I think in that paper they used 11 colours to identify live dead cells and then immunophenotype. And then you can go on and look in a lot more detail at actually, well, what are these individual cells doing? Um, one of the things which I think is really exciting is, uh, uh, and it's been done for class 1 tetramers, uh, so a paper last year from Evan Newell, uh, looking at uh, how you then go and say, well, these are the specific cells I'm really interested in because these are, uh, are, are specific epitope recognizing cells. And then you can kind of uh, work out whether you're getting a, um, you know, stronger responses to particular epitopes. And I think for biotherapeutic de-immunization or, or uh, risk assessment, uh, that might help in terms of trying to work out, uh, well, one, which are the residues you might want to alter to make a better biotherapeutic. I think there's also potential for tolerance in this area. Um, this is, of course, uh, something that we need to understand in the context of uh, being with class two tetramers, I think is another technological challenge above class one tetramers. So, um, we'll see what kind of uh, happens in this area, but you know, I think it's an exciting new technology uh, that we should be aware of. Um, there's a few talking points, and I don't necessarily want to address these right now, but maybe things that we can uh, discuss either at Q&A or in the afternoon discussion session. Uh, one of those is around the assay consistency. Um, that uh, I, I guess it's not necessarily that the assays might come out completely differently each time, but uh, there's a lot of biological variation, and I guess we, we're all familiar with biological variation, uh, which makes it a wonderful thing when you've got a room of very different people, but it makes it very tricky when you actually try and treat those different people. Um, and indeed, you know, I've talked about the ex vivo assays being kind of like a clinical trial in a sense, 
they're often done on the kind of numbers that you would do a, uh, a phase one in. So you know, you, you're not necessarily expecting to see what would happen in the whole population, but you are getting at least an early view on what might happen. Um, things about cycle times around some of the assays as well. Um, you know, I guess it depends on the program, but we quite often have uh, uh, you know, quite hard uh, timelines to work to and to be able to go away and do some of these assays where we're, you know, we're kind of culturing things, let dendritic cells do their own thing, let the T cells expand. It all takes that bit of time when uh, uh, you know, our protein engineers are furiously producing different sequences and testing them and saying, we've got the antibody we really want. So um, you know, I think there's some challenges there that we, uh, we try to address a bit with the in silico, but we'd like to make that a bit more predictive. Uh, and then the cost as well, that uh, for some of these assays, it's fairly easy to put multiple potential test articles in, particularly the peptide-based ones. When it comes to the uh, whole proteins um, and uh, putting those in, you know, I think there's, there are some challenges which, if you're thinking about using these approaches, actually finding the right time to apply the right assay is something that's quite important to think about. Um, just a couple of other things that I wanted to touch on. Uh, one would be around, uh, you know, I've not really done much about B cells today. Uh, they're the ones producing the antibodies. Is there something more we can understand about this? So we've kind of thought about, well, how would you look at um, maybe applying the next generation sequencing and look at the different B cell receptors? And it may be that there's something useful we can do in preclinical species so we can like dose our antibodies look at the ADA that develop, and then actually select out the individual B cells. Um, and there are some nice approaches now where when you take uh, individual B cells and actually look at the sequences, you can pretty much track back where they're derived from. So a, a slightly sketchy uh, phylogenetic tree, if you like, to say, well, you know, there may be some responses in here that lead to neutralizing antibodies, and they may be derived from a particular um, uh, I guess lineage of your antibody and that may be something that you're really worried about because you've got a preclinical response that uh, you wouldn't want to see in humans. Perhaps this can help you say well is that really something that's going to be a problem when I get to humans. But this comparison of uh, lineage I think you know we're, we're a long way off from being able to do this easily um, but you know I think it's the kind of thing that if we had uh, multiple data sets that we could start to assess whether this is going to be something useful to do. And uh, as uh, Jeremy mentioned, sort of my background includes some virology in there, so uh, you know, I really enjoy reading the papers on HIV uh, in this context as well. Um, so uh, uh, I'd be able to refer you to those at some point as well. Um, and but the same question as well can arise not only for the B cell receptors but the T cell receptors. Uh, I suppose at least uh, in our sense at the minute would be if we think that we can bind a peptide to an HLA molecule and that HLA molecule, uh, um, oh, and we can then see a, a T cell response. Then our assumption is, well, you know, this can happen. It's likely to happen at some point in our patient population, depending on other risk factors. Is there something more we can do by actually understanding the T cell responses? Um, it feels a little bit academic to me right now, but that may be just because we don't have enough data to point us to really what decisions could we make with that data in hand. Uh, but maybe just I'm missing something. So if anyone's wiser than me in the audience, I'll be happy to talk to you about that as well. So uh, as I mentioned at the top, that you know one of the ways that we're uh, trying to look at this is to integrate this data. So you know we, we're able to use the ex vivo assays as they are because they're giving us information that uh, will enable us to say, well, you know we prefer to take this candidate forward rather than this one because we're getting you know fewer responses in a DCT assay, for example. But we're also able to drill down with things like the DCMS assay to, to work out well, you know, what is the, um, uh, what's being presented when we put an antibody into a dendritic cell. Um, we've done some basic uh, uh, modeling work around, well, you know, if this is a, a highly T cell driven process and you dose something like Humira, well, you know, what's going to happen in your patients? Who's going to generate the antibody response? What magnitude will it be? And then on this uh, right-hand side, uh, given different drug clearance rates in the population, what will the effect be of that ADA in terms of clearance? Now, um, we've got papers out on this uh, just this month, so uh, 
I, you know, I'm really interested to hear any feedback on those because uh, you know, it's a mathematical modeling approach. As with most of these approaches, we try and simplify. We may have oversimplified. <laughs> we may have included things that maybe make less sense to some people and omitted things that really we need to keep in. So um, uh, what I'll say for now is that it's intriguing to think that applying this kind of modeling could help us get to the point where we understand what's likely to happen in the clinic uh, even at the stage where we're uh, early development and we've not yet been into a patient. Whereas at the minute, you know, we're doing our phase ones and still not really knowing what's going to happen in phase two or phase three. Or indeed post-marketing, which is obviously where it's going to impact the patients. So I'd just like to finish up by acknowledging uh, certainly members of the group. So the, the modelling work and a number of these slides I borrowed from uh, Xiaoying Chen. Um, she uh, started in Pfizer as a, on a postdoctoral programme. Uh, and became a full-time colleague with us uh, uh, earlier this year. So uh, you know, it's great that we can kind of do some of this leading edge science, if you like, and uh, uh, be able to search, show where we can translate this into uh, practicality for drug development. Uh, Li Xu uh, and Mark Zhang have been doing uh, a lot of the work around the internalization assays and the activation assays. Um, and uh, Paolo and Bonnie have been, uh, I guess, uh, uh, orchestrating some of the uh, strategy behind this and so it's been very useful for discussions as we've uh, approached this. I heard someone this morning ask uh, uh, Proem, you asked Jeremy, well kind of what do you do? So I will acknowledge Proemune for their assay services, but also their professional advice. So they're not just going to kind of run an assay and then ignore you, They'll, they will speak through and, and go through some of the details of really what that data can mean for you as well. Uh, and then, of course, for the invitation to speak. So thank you very much, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Tim. Thank you. Kevin. Let me put a, a, a sort of realistic question to you. Uh, if you have an antibody that is injected into a patient, kills cells through complement or ADCC, are the epitopes that are going to be generated predictable in the sort of assays you do where you have no lysis, no proteases generated? Do you have a way of uh, establishing <coughs> whether you're going to have similar range of epitopes? Uh, so I can imagine ways where we could do that kind of experiment before we feed it into a DCT assay. I mean, obviously, depending on the mechanism by which that occurs, then... You mean kill cells in vitro and then put that into the nitrogen cell? Could be, could be pretty messy, but it'd be intriguing to see whether these assays would be able to answer that question. Have we done it? No. <laughs> I don't know whether Jeremy can comment on whether you've done that with uh, any test articles or for any clients. Well, I have two further closest to calm, I guess, is to, um, for example, those... Yes, I'm interested. Do you mind if I... Please, go ahead. I'll come back to your point. I've seen examples in the past um, where, in the case of tetanus, toxoid, where the ESO receptor binds the toxoid, and then as a result, certain epitopes are protected, and so 
I think that uh, the guy in Dundee, what's his name? Um, Watts, Colin Watts. Certain epitopes are generated based on the epitopes that are being found because somehow they're protected in the digestion process. So the epitope may make a difference to the range of epitopes that, are, that the therapeutic protein can generate. That's why when, when you analyze in the absence of the, of the antigen, that's my question away. In the absence of all the other things that could happen, would the epitopes be overlapping? Would they be similar? Would they be different? So I think that certainly would be value in doing these assays with and without the target for your antibody. Yeah. So I was thinking about when uh, you posed the question in the context of if you're lysing a cell. So it may be, you know, are you looking at uh, pre-processing of your therapeutic with all those proteases? So that might be something that would influence um, uh, what then is processed and presented by the dendritic cell. So, you know, that could be tested. Is it going to be pre-processed in the same way as in the context of a cell? I don't know. Uh, the other question might be around whether the uh, cell components that you're now uh, have uh, externalized, are they going to cause different interactions and signals on the dendritic cell that they'll uh, process and present differently? So I think there's some really important questions in there that may, well, right now we probably can't predict, but certainly we have some tools that we could look at some differences there. Yeah, so I just wanted to add that the Susan Frisch mentioned that maybe the wound environment 